I didn't share. I was a little worried about that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Welcome to uh, Geography Department Speaker Series. Um, uh, this afternoon, we have Dr. Carrie Yard of, from School of Environmental and Natural Resources um, as our speaker, and I invite Dr. Suren Day to introduce her. So I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Carrie Yard uh, as our colloquial presenter today. Dr. Art is an associate professor in in environmental and natural resource sociology. I just want to make sure I get the title correctly. In the School of Environment and Natural Resources here at RSU. Her research explores social processes create um, and sustain environmental inequality in ways in the past and how these unequal exposures are linked to health disparities. She uses sociological concepts to understand the issues of social inequalities and the environment. Her work covers the art of environmental inequality from an investigation into its political process to its ultimate consequences of social disparities in health outcomes. Dr. Art's perspective is that scholars need to bring the insights from the field of sociology to bear the process of environmental risks and resulting health effects. Her goal is to uncover the political leverage points that will address social inequalities 
Dr. Art received her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from San Francisco State University, a Master's of Science from Environmental Policy and Behavior from the University of Michigan, and a dual PhD degree in Sociology and Natural Resources and Environment from the University of Michigan. Um, without further ado, let's join me to welcome Dr. Art. <laughs> At five, after right after the talk, grad student please stay and we have round table with Dr. Art. And faculties are welcome as well to join the or learn more about Dr. Art's research. We'll have pizza. It's over room 1186. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hi. Oh, it's so nice to see so many uh, familiar faces in the crowd. I have uh, chaired several committees with. You all are shared community um, with you all, and it's just nice to be over here among some friendly faces. Uh, okay, so today I am going to be taking you on my intellectual journey um, that I started trying to understand environmental inequality um, and really try to dismantle the environmental and health um, disparities that we are currently are uh, stuck with today in the United States. So uh, through this process, I really realized it's the role of spatial segregation and organizing risk across space. So trying to understand the local policies that really keep that in place is where I am uh, heading my research, research towards. Um, so I'm trying to take you along what I've learned along the way. Um, it's this thing. Uh -oh. Oh, no. If you click using a mouse, on the screen, yeah. then now point it at the computer. Point it at this computer. Working with the mouse. No. How did that work? Okay. How did you do that? Yes, it works now. I'm just thinking it Okay. Okay. Same button, but. There we go, okay, that's me. <laughs> so I just wanna tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, actually grew up in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. And a week after my 18th birthday, I jumped in the car and I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> um, and I landed in San Francisco where uh, actually they had a pretty good educational system out there. So I, if I worked full time, I was able to afford an uh, undergraduate degree. So I got a job as an animal care and control officer. Um, which took me all around the city to all these different places. Um, and, you know, growing up in Columbus, Ohio, I uh, was very isolated in largely white communities. We are a highly segregated metropolitan area, but San Francisco is very diverse, right? Um, and this job really took me to other parts of the city, other parts of um, other communities. For example, here's, I don't know if you can really see it, this is, I had a boyfriend who was like really artistic. <laughs> he took this photo of me like touring. It, it's ridiculous now, but this is a hazardous waste site, right? <laughs> Next to me with my skirt. Um, but, you know, I, it really helped open my eyes, right? Coming from a, a pretty isolated um, a white suburb of Ohio uh, to, to environmental inequality out there. Um, and I started realizing and actually taking classes in human geography, which taught me that hazardous waste sites were more likely to be in uh, non-white communities, more likely to be in low-income areas. And, you know, living in San Francisco and experiencing this, well, I just thought it was disgusting um, that there's such a violation to me to be poisoning air of kids uh, just because of the color of their skin, that they were more exposed to it because their parents could be afford uh, a way to move. So I, I really devoted my life to this. I wanted to spend um, time trying to figure out how to undo this. Um, so that's me. I uh, um, applied to study with Dr. Dorcita Taylor, who's an environmental historian uh, at the University of Michigan, which has become my mentor um, and taught me a lot about environmental inequality and how race is organized, has organized and been a major organizing principle of American, um, organizing American cities. So, um, actually, 
find that out. It's okay. I, I don't, there's like a little video. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. Has anybody ever seen this video besides people in my class at Brandon? <laughs> so I love this video because it shows the world's populations. I'm not going to try to play it because I'm, I'm scared of your technology. But um, it pops up basically all of these little dots over time. Um, every one million people pops up a dot. And understanding where the world was at, that's like the milieu of, of where people's minds were, right, when America was born, um, is really, I think, essential to understanding where we are today. Uh, so, you know, this is, we have, you know, Roman Empire, Silk Road, and then over time, right, um, bubonic plague, um, the transatlantic slave trade, and the Industrial Revolution happening um, very close in time period when America was uh, starting to develop its cities. So America became a country in 1776, and it was built during this time period where race seemed to be really essential to understanding the world around us. Uh, okay. So um, so it was during this time period, you have that a little timeline on the top, uh, where US cities exploded with an influx of immigrants and people from all different cultures. It was like our first globalization at, um, right in, in the United States. We have things like the camera coming out in 1816. It's like that gave us this photo. Um, we have Origin of the Species published, all these amazing advancements which brought you know, images like this and people together, um, as well as the theory of evolution and what we now call genetic inheritance, the Mendelian inheritance, and the Civil War ending, so emancipation of millions of African Americans. So this kind of thrust of humanity into one uh, American cities was seemed, race seemed very essential to understanding what was happening. Um, and also there's a trust in science that trust that science will lead us to this truth and uh, the same, <clears throat> excuse me, the salience of the physical world and these kind of cultural characteristics and explaining what was around us. It's, it's not surprising why the eugenics movement um, really took hold of the American psyche. So uh, Francis Galton was a European statistician who's actually a cousin of Charles Darwin and he's the one who coined the term eugenics in 1883. So again, think about the time period, right around the same time that America cities, all of these people with different looks, different cultures, different ways of speaking and eating and acting, all smooshed together. Um, and Galton argued that each race was kind of a representation of a different pathway of human evolution. Um, now we know, it's completely wrong, right? That race is socially constructed that there's not one gene or one characteristic that people of the same race have in common. I like to tell my students that um, race, oh, sorry, I think it touched something. That race is, uh, race is socially constructed because you can change races. And so if we pick you up here, pick some of you think you know what your race is here, and we put you in a different country like Brazil, right? You would be considered a different race probably, or it's possible, right? We know that, um, that money whitens is one of the phrases in, in Brazil. So race changes across space. It also changes across time. You know, in the United States, you'd be able to cross a line at certain periods of time and your race would change, right? So, you know, the idea that race is socially constructed is, is, um, is a new idea, right? But pretty well established. Okay, so this, I like to give an example of the United States, um, just to kind of get us to understand how important these, the idea of race was in organizing our cities. So this is uh, Social Explorer, which I'm sure a lot of you have used, uh, 1790 census, so our first census. And the darker spots are hot spots of populations. You can see that New York City has always been a hot spot, right? Um, and it's exemplary, really, of how American cities grew and organized themselves. So Five Points is one of those kind of famous slums. It was shown in the movie uh, Games of New York, if anybody's ever seen that. Um, it is, <clears throat> is one of these places that had uh, largely a newly emancipated slaves, and Irish, um, German immigrants. And uh, as immigrants came, they were really funneled into this place. 
This is also a place that was built on top of what was called a collect. So a it used to be a water source of the city um, before the city started growing and use up all the water. However, <laughs> you know, these are the places, kind of uh, low-lying areas that a lot of the impoverished um, people who came over without a lot of money would end up. So you can see the ground is unstable. There's pools of water which are bounded and became cesspools. Can you see that okay? Those are the toilets. <laughs> so there's a really a lack of infrastructure um, and that was rampant in, in these parts of the cities of tenements. And unsurprisingly, cholera and other diseases became um, really associated with these areas you know, in these ethnic enclaves. So these were the places where those poor ethnic groups were funneled, um, the same places with unsanitary conditions, encouraging the spread of diseases amongst these populations who had similar backgrounds in similar cultures. Um, so just like today, there are these kids living in these toxic areas, right? Over here on the side, you can see children with uh, in front of the street where there's human and animal excrement, right? Um, so these are the places where people were getting ill. We're on the other side of town. <laughs> the wealthy had street sweepers in structure, right? Um, they had lower disease rates. And it's the same as today where you know that, you know, the richest 1% of our population live up to 15 years longer than the poorest, right? So this is what the fundamental cause theory is, that social inequality is linked to health inequality, not just because of the constraints of place on people with low incomes, but because the health advantages uh, enjoyed by those with the high status. Okay. So as American cities were being organized um, by race, by income, right, uh, the Great Migration happened. And African Americans fled the South. There was bull legal infestations for those sharecroppers, making it untenable for them to use um, to uh, toil on the farms anymore to feed themselves. They were also fleeing some pretty uh, disgusting area uh, racism in the South. But they went up to the North, you know, the industrializing North, um, and entered into a, already a highly racialized uh, cities. So, um, there we go. I know a lot of you know this. <laughs> this is uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, the redlining map, right? So it further ingrained, when African Americans came up, the redlining maps further ingrained race into space. So in 1935, the homeowners, low corporation created these residential risk maps. Um, so they use race as an indicator of bad investment. So those areas with higher population of non-whites, right, were outlined in red. Um, this has been a, a good, you probably know this, um, the maps that have been brought up from this uh, and have been digitized have been used recently in a lot of literature um, showing that these have profound impacts. So those red light areas are still the areas that have uh, a lot of health problems, a lot of environmental risk. Okay, so this is a one dot map um, where one for 2020 census, where every one dot equals 770 people. And the brown are uh, white alone, non Hispanic white, uh, uh, non Hispanic um, uh, American Indian, Asian alone, Black or African American, right? And we can still see that these are the red light areas that um, set into place these processes that uh, that made it so that these areas are um, did not have tax. Let me just zone it. Okay. Right. So here is Ohio. We have um, again the uh, clusters of African Americans, right, in these areas that were redlined. This is the redlining map. Really lines up pretty perfectly with with these areas that are still predominantly African-American. Um, here's again, Columbus zooming in, right? And if you overlay this, I should make that screen, I think we actually already this, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sure, it's fine. <laughs> I should be alive when I join the Zoom. Okay. Let's get the wrong one. That's good. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
So again, these areas that were marked as bad investments were um, really depriving these communities, which is mortgages, depriving them of um, and, and depreciating. So these are the places that uh, African Americans largely lived. They were seen as bad investments, so they didn't get loans for homes, right? So the homes in these areas did not appreciate in value as much as homes in other areas, right? So um, you start to get a, a, a lower tax base that social services um, normally pull from. Uh, okay, right. And we still see this today, right? So this is, uh, <laughs> right? So this is toxic releases in air. Again, you can see pretty clearly that that same kind of redlining. Something yeah. has happened. <laughs> still charging. <laughs> okay. okay, you can see communities like Upper Arlington, which annexed themselves, right? Um, so they annexed themselves pretty soon after uh, African Americans started coming up during the Great Migration, right? They became their own separate entity. Um, and we can see that they were able to kind of uh, Possess right a lot of the resources here. So this is life expectancy. Uh, can I go back? Uh, yeah, again, toxic releases, life expectancy, um, and you can overlay so many other things with that. That again, this redlining. So, so we're seeing again. I'm taking you through my like intellectual trajectory, right? Uh, clearly, it was it was starting to become very clear that segregation plays a major role in the processes of environmental risk and health inequality. Um, so this is a paper that I published where I looked at all these different measures of um, racial segregation uh, across MSAs across the US. And I found that by every measure, except for one kind of weird measure, um, uh, those places that had higher levels of segregation had worse pollution for everyone. Everybody in the community had worse pollution, right? Which is interesting. I mean, certainly African Americans were worse off, which is what you would expect. But I think the fact that there was higher pollution for everyone said something to me. Um, and it got me thinking. <laughs> also, Laura Pluto came around um, during this time period, published uh, this, I think it was human, did I write it? Progresses in Human Geography, um, this argument about racial capitalism. And I was like, that? That explains exactly what I'm looking at at my findings. So racial capitalism is this argument, which comes um, from a black Marxism and earlier on, but she took it and was arguing that um, to explain environmental inequality, but she basically racial capitalism is a structuring logic of, of capitalism. It requires that spaces in our communities be less valued right, by society in order for us to locate those locally unwanted land uses, like hazardous facilities. It's like, okay, that makes sense why these places that are, uh, have such high levels of segregation, those are the places that have more industrial pollution, more industrial activity, right? Um, because they're the ones that would be able to bring it in and it makes sure that it's put over there, right? And in and, the and, uh, kind of sacrifice zone is what it's been called by Bob Bullard. So this is actually uh, this whole argument of zones of industry and zones, uh, sacrifice zones, came about in 1920s and 1930s in the human ecology literature, which argued that industries are going to group together, right? So you have industries that need certain landscape features, um, for example, uh, steel, right? You know, you look upon the water, uh, the water edges, and you see these kind of industrial places because Steel industries need water for cooling processes, right? So they need that landscape feature, right? And so you get one siting, one place, and then all the others kind of say, yeah, okay, that works. We're gonna start using the landscape and the infrastructure that you've already built. So you get these clusters, right, of, of locally unwanted land uses. Okay, so if they, um, 
these facilities are supposed to be economic development. You know, are people actually develop or are they actually benefiting economically from these places? Um, recent, it's not so recent anymore, I guess, um, but 19, 2018, Ashton Boyce published uh, one of the first studies looking at this, trying to understand are those facilities that are putting out pollution, are they actually providing jobs, right? Because they are often brought into poor communities saying, we're going to, you know, increase economic revital or increase economic activity and revitalize you. Um, but it wasn't shown to be uh, supported, right? So Ashton Boyce found that there was no evidence that these facilities were that were creating higher pollution um, actually were providing employment for surrounding communities. Okay, so um, why? <laughs> okay, so what is the what is this argument then that's being put forth? We have you know, this argument of economic development or what um, Bob Buller calls economic or environmental trade-off, right? Where a, a facility will come in and say that we're going to provide you jobs. You might have to deal with some of the health risks. You might have to deal with some of the air pollution, but we're going to provide you jobs, right? And political people like Trump and others um, argue that, you know, we're going to bring back this kind of idealized policy days of, of uh, America, where we're going to have these kind of company towns that provide jobs, provide community, and so on. Um, but in fact, certainly, manufacturing is doing fine in the US, right? Our, our output is increasing. Um, however, <laughs> manufacturing employment is going down, right? Um, and that's because manufacturing facilities and those uh, facilities that put out a lot of this toxic air pollution are becoming more mechanized. Um, so this is one of the qualitative studies that's trying to understand this. Uh, this is one of the poly, the largest polyvinyl fluoride plant, um, Shintec in Louisiana during in that Cancer Alley. If anybody's ever heard of that area, but it's an area where there's a lot of industrial toxics. Um, and they said, we're gonna come in site, we're gonna in provide economic activity um, they were given a lot of tax incentives to site. Um, and once they were built, so again, 40% of the population below the poverty line where they cited themselves. But once they were built, the officials admitted that actually none of the labor was going to come from the local community because educational level, the technical expertise were not there, right? So instead, people are commuting in from outside the community. So really, that fits really well with this racial capitalism argument. And also kind of explains that those places that are highly segregated are more likely to be bringing in industrial um, toxins for economic activity. OK, it's a bit messy, but let me take you through this. I tried to investigate this. I'm quantitative, obviously, so I, I tried to figure out how to do this in a quantitative way. This is uh, the density of industrial facilities per square mile in census tract. And then I'm looking at poverty um, segregation and racial um, poverty segregation, trying to figure out, okay, those places that have high segregation are also more likely to have industrial facilities, right? And this is true when you're looking at whites. So places where whites have higher levels of um, Segregation by poverty status are more likely to have um, more likely to have industrial activity. Same thing with African Americans in poverty. When you're comparing African Americans in poverty between whites not in poverty, right? You have pretty high levels of industrial activity. Um, same thing with the Hispanic pop Hispanics in poverty and whites not in poverty. And then this is African Americans in poverty and whites in poverty. So you see the, those outliers, right, are the within race. Um, so African-Americans in poverty to not in poverty. Don't, they don't, the same patterns aren't showing up, right? So this really, it, I think, is pretty supportive of the racial capitalism argument. Um, okay. So I was like, all right, let's look at some policies. Let's figure out. So when we learn about policies, at least in the, um, in my education, I we often learned about federal policies, right? So federal policies dealing with environmental justice are not there. What we do have is an environmental justice executive order that was signed by Batman, Bill Clinton, 1994. Um, he basically was like, we need to think about environmental justice 
in our government. Um, so we need to think about how our policies and programs and activities will be affecting minority populations and low income populations. Great. Okay. So I was like, how, how has this affected us? Um, has this, you know, had some major influence on us? You would think the EPA specifically um, and how it's monitoring industrial facilities, it would have an effect. So I looked at the 10 years after he signed that executive order. I um, plotted all these industrial uh, facilities, it's about 17,000 of them, figured out where the um, fallout from about 400 chemicals landed in every one by one kilometer square in the US. It's big data, right? Um, and then this data, so this is one by one kilometer square, right? So that across the whole US, we figured out where all these pollutants landed and then figured out how toxic they were. So if some were associated with, you know, higher levels of cancer, for example, um, but those are toxic weights that the EPA provided. So figuring out, okay, this is what was in this area, right? This is the amount of toxic here, who lived here, right? And then how, how does that look over time? This is what we found. Um, so over the years, 1995, the 10 years after the signing of that executive order, pollution has gone down. I had somebody call me from Ohio EPA and say, can I use your data to show that we don't need to um, regulate the chemicals anymore? I was like, I was like, no, it's still under review. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it, it's true though. There's been improvements. Uh, certainly, there's decreases in exposure to African Americans specifically. Um, I always tell people don't pay so much attention to this. I've looked at this in other papers. Because Hispanic population, what the heck is that? And so there's so many different groups of, of people that fall into that population. Um, so yeah, put that aside for now. But this was a pretty interesting finding. What was more interesting, I thought, was that African Americans, um, so in general, African Americans in poverty had the most exposure, right? African Americans, not in poverty, second most exposure, whites in poverty, and then whites not in poverty. But this was this was the key finding for me. Um, African Americans were not as uh, protected, right, from increased socioeconomic status. So also this gap is pretty consistent over time, right? African Americans consistently were twice as exposed to uh, toxics. Okay. So again, I'm <laughs> that was leading me to think. Okay, federal policies uh, they're not exactly helping with um, the decreasing. The, the disparity in exposure. Um, and this is probably why, <laughs> like we don't really have any teeth in our policies and any policies that have teeth die in subcommittee. So um, a student and I, who's actually at the White House now, Matthew, um, he and I looked through all of the different policies that were submitted um, and tried to get uh, footing and all of them died in subcommittee, right? So, the federal level was not, was not where it was happening. Um, so we started looking to the state level, right? So the state level, we, um, this is another student, uh, two students, we looked at different state policies to address environmental justice. Um, this is, the, uh, okay, so this is state policy strength down here. So um, if a state had really strong policies, meaning a law, um, or the number of policies, right, they would be down here. Um, if state didn't have any policies like Ohio, they would be down here, right? Um, and then these are how, how the exposure to air toxics has changed over time for African Americans in poverty and whites in poverty. You'll see that there's no, there's no difference, right? They're not, not doing anything. Um, and one of the reasons, in fact, it actually looks, see, kind of narrows here, um, it's actually getting slightly worse for African Americans and slightly better for whites in poverty. Um, the stronger a state has uh, enacted state policies to deal with them today. So you are like, why? Why is that? Um, we think it's possible that the policies, so these are the policies of actions organized by type, um, community participation. Like everybody thought all of these, yeah, all of the states are like, we just need to get them to participate more. 
right? Um, where in fact, I've uh, done some research um, previously that actually shows that communities, African American communities um, specifically, have higher levels of petitions um, signing, higher levels of protest. And importantly, the, these differences did not explain their, uh, how close an uh, industrial facility was to them. So it's not that they're not participating, right? That's not it. Um, there's, yeah, that's a good example. Okay. So, so this led me to where I am now, <laughs> which is local policy regimes, right? So I feel like most of my, uh, everything I've been taught is about the federal level. That's where EPA is, that's the state level, it's where EPA is. But really to understand environmental inequality, I really think that we need to dig into the local policy regime level. So for those of you who are, can you do the um, For those of you uh, who aren't so familiar with our federalist system, right? We have uh, a long history of understanding of federal governments trying to influence us, our social safety net at the local level. So 1930s to 1970s, we had FDR arguing that it's the purpose of the government to see that not only the legitimate interests of the few are protected, but that the welfare and rights of the many are conserved. So he was like, let's help people. He got us uh, the social security, right? He, he did a lot of these kind of big programs. Um, later on, we have Johnson saying, uh, so here's a great society. It's time that it's going to be soon when nobody will be poor. So more on poverty, right? Um, this is, he started Medicaid, Medicare. Um, and then we have uh, devolution, right? So we have Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan uh, really uh, spearheaded this, what we they, they called starving the beast. So austerity measures to basically take funding away from the government, um, including local governments pulling big funding away, right? To kind of uh, starve this beast of the government. Um, he thought government had been overreaching too much, right? But this means that we have a lot of uh, policies and programs falling now on local local communities, like gover uh, counties and, and um, regional regional uh, governmental. I can't think of the word. Uh, I'll thank you there in a second. Um, but these kind of local local governments, right? And it's been argued that this kind of more decentralized arrangement allows for discretion that breeds inequality. So uh, as you pull down to the local level and you start to take away funds um, and you start to give more, uh, you know, leeway for local communities, that those kind of racist um, tendencies that are kind of inbuilt in these communities uh, because of how we've been developed will start to, to have major in impacts. Um, and this is what people have been finding, right? So we have this uh, policy regime. First off, policy regimes are basically governing arrangements, right? So in our federal system, we have the federal government, we have the state government, we have local governments. Um, it's kind of a nesting, and there's lots of interactions that happen in between all of those things. So it's it's, it, it's complicated and hard to measure, but there's new measures, or, um, new methods that I'll talk about here in a minute um, that will help us try to parse this out. But we are finding, so this is a, a study that was done by a colleague of mine in 2020, um, and it looked at life expectancy by state uh, over time, and they used policy regimes. So they looked at tobacco, uh, environment, tax, and labor. So they looked at all of the different state policies that dealt with those issues, and then tried to figure out how they map on to life expectancy. And they found that, that changes in life expectancy were associated with changes in state policy on a conservative liberal continuum, actually, where more liberal policies expanded economic regulations and protected marginalized groups. So in fact, they found that this related to, um, well, in 1984, the difference between Connecticut and Oklahoma was only 4.9 years. And that because of these differences in how they, um, uh, had their policies, right, the policy regimes, that it expanded to 6.8 years. So, okay, that's policy regime. Again, that's at the state level, right? Um, doing it at the local level is a little more complicated, however, certainly important, right? So this is spatial, um, 
can see this is at the county level. This is a individual sorry, individual poverty rates, right? And the likelihood of experiencing poverty in Appalachia right here is about 20 to 30 percent greater than experiencing it in Eugene, Oregon, right? So that's pretty big. Um, that's a pretty big difference. So local level policies, policy regimes are essential for understanding and dismantling the environmental inequality and in health disparities that we see. So this is this is where I'm going with my own research. I am attempting to create policy regimes at the local level that characterize um, social determinant of health. So that's pretty messy because what is the social determinant of health? You ask somebody, there's lots of different definitions, but I'm working with people in the medical school to do reviews umbrella review of literature to try to figure out what the literature says is a social determinant of health and how it relates to health outcomes. And then we're going to take those and query the policies. So the state of Ohio, it, it's a, quite an undertaking. The state of Ohio, there are 24 regional planning councils. That's what I can think of. 88 counties and over a thousand local governments, right? Um, so we are first starting with, in a project I'm in with Harvey Miller, actually, oh, yeah, I'm doing it too, um, right, where we are doing, uh, we are trying to look at the uh, the different health outcomes according to these policy uh, um, boundaries. So we're plotting the trajectories of these different social determinants of health to figure out what are those areas that are doing better than we would think, what are those areas that are doing worse than we think, and then interrogate what are the policies in that area that address those social determinants of health? And then pulling those back out. Um, so this is the, the uh, bivariate latent curve modeling we're doing. It's one of a pretty useful way to measure changes over time. Um, we're taking, again, these county calendars and trying to understand which policy environment best explains what we need. I'm also starting to use a uh, or learning, trying to this summer and try to get myself up to date on MIDA. It's a new way to look at multi-level modeling. So multi-level modeling, anybody done it before? Oh, okay, it's you. So multi-level modeling takes into account, um, basically when you figures out, okay, this so much of the variation is because you come from this group of people. So for example, a classroom of students, right? You can say, oh, those students have this kind of characteristic because they came from that classroom. Previously, the levels have only been linked. To, you could only really do two to three levels. This new method lets you look at like 190. So it would really help us to parse out all of the different policies over time um, to figure out the interactions between them and really break down this kind of federalist system that is uh, maintaining our inequality. Um, this is also going to be a good data source. So Biden has put in a bunch of funds to improve both social infrastructure. So in fact, he's putting basically blood back into the beast, right? So the beast has been starved, um, and now he's putting funds back into this beast of government. And so following those funds to figure out what are the programs that have done well over time and which ones aren't um, will be really a good source of robust data that I hope to use. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's where I'm at in my intellectual trajectory of how to dismantle environmental inequality. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Any questions from students first? So, thank you for your talk. Based on what you've kind of covered so far, do you think the answer for your future lies in federal policy making or state policy making, or should we just focus on the local? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that with a little story that uh, I actually went to Congress and spoke to senators and they talked about my research on the floor and nobody was listening, right? I sat, I was so proud of myself. I sat there, they were like talking about me on this floor and nobody was there. <laughs> like, so I don't think it's at the federal. I think it's way too political up there, I just don't. Um, pretty similarly with the state level, um, but the local level, I feel like people, at least in, in environmental justice, haven't actually really dug into that yet. So 
Uh, yes, look below. <laughs> yeah. Okay, other questions? Do you want to follow up? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick follow up. So um, do you think like at the local level, because political geography doesn't necessarily always overlap with economic geography or co-location of industries, um, do you feel like regions that are known to kind of work together a little bit more than others, like Central Ohio works reasonably better together than maybe Cleveland or Cincinnati? Um, just coming from economic development literature, do you think we see differences amongst those regions, or is it like no hope for it? Okay, political regions, you mean? Um, yeah, so like uh, Franklin County mm -hmm. and like Delaware or Columbus working with Upper Arlington. Mm -hmm. So at the local level, if the regions are working together, do we see differences between that versus regions at the local level that don't work well together? Right. Okay. Uh, I think I think I see what you're saying. Uh, I I don't know the answer to that. I do know that I hope to understand kind of regional um, policy link, like Morpsey, for example. Um, that's a kind of you know that is one of the one of the things. Yeah. Yeah. So I I guess I'm curious about how in the future work that you're describing, but then also in maybe one of the previous studies uh, where you showed the difference between Oklahoma and then another state, I'm in Connecticut. Um, uh -huh. I'm wondering how in, in the, those kinds of analyses, the like the social determinants of health or other attributes of the policies are like quantified and then entered into these like large analyses. Yeah, so how do you define, again, it's like, how do you define a social determinant of health policy? Um, so that is why it's very ambiguous right now what a social determinant of health is. Um, um, CDC, WHO, very different. Um, well, not very different, but different. Different enough for sure. Um, so right now I am working with some doctors um, in the cancer, Wexner's Cancer Institute. Anyway, some oh, people over there. Um, and we are <laughs> looking at the literature and trying to review and figure out, okay, what are the measures of social determinants of health? Like, what are they actually measuring and how are they relating to, well, cancer health outcomes in this case? Um, and then we will be using those measures, those keywords kind of, to, to query the policies that we, um, you know, the local policies, uh, regional policies, state policies, does that make sense? To figure out how, uh, how to classify them. But other people have done other things, like the people who do this, for example. There's there's been other work on on how to quantify policy regimes. But that's what we're doing for social determinants of health. Okay, so it's sort of like classifying the policies based on whether or not they basically, basically have certain key terms. So. Yes, yeah, yeah, based on the measures that yeah the key terms that we got from the literature, right, the medical literature. Right. Uh, this way. Um, I'm curious about um, how you're considering COVID um, and like this is just like a huge thing and there's long COVID we don't know really what's happening with it and what it really looks like today, tomorrow, and years from now um, and I don't know it, I feel like it could really be muddy a lot of the waters maybe or if it's like I don't know but just, yeah, I'm just curious about it. Yeah uh, I I mean, I'm just thinking about what it would look like when we mess it out, right? I feel like it looks like a big bloop for everybody. Um, and so you'd have to consider that for sure. But I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it would be one of a specific kind of social determinant of health that you could look at with COVID. It's like the hair. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was just curious, uh, uh, how's the local level fine? Is it like county to county or is it like upper Arlington versus Plainville? Like, you know, the more uh, uh -huh. yeah, more. Well, it's mostly looking at. Oops. Yeah. Right. So, um, in the state of Ohio, right, we have 88 counties for sure. Uh, but there's also kind of, you know, uh, like I said, regional planning councils. Local governments, villages, so anything that's enacting.
you know, it looks like maybe segregation is the result of political choices. And I mean, result of political choices, I mean, at federal level and state level, and you have, have interacted with different policies in the federal level. So what's your assessment of uh, yeah, what we can call a critical policy moving forward? Mm -hmm. um, well, what's your assessment um, um, how in the direction of the moving forward because of these misunderstandings? So how do we define equitable policy in a, a world that's already pretty safe? How do we look at or trajectory to achieve a critical policy moving forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we have to start with, again, the history and you know, the, where the policy levels already or funding levels already were, right? And what mechanisms were already there. And then work from there. <laughs> so not everybody's starting at the same place. That I think that might be insane. All right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sorry. If you, yeah, I, I think that's it. I mean, basically, I was curious about, I mean, Changes in policy at state and federal level to address these oh, inequalities. I see. Multiple disadvantages. I see. Well, right now, so I have some friends who are um, getting funds from this Biden administration, uh, the social infrastructure, and they are just just use money, put it in fast, you know. So I um, actually don't think that that's the best way to. Uh, so there's going to be lots of uh, data to look at at least, right, to figure out. Okay, this is what funding is doing. Um, and we can start from there. Which ones are, which ones are decreasing inequality, um, and then maybe try to investigate, you know, and put funds towards those ones that are increasing or decreasing inequality. So. Okay. Yeah, I've got a quick question. Uh, earlier on the presentation, you showed a bar graph uh, that had multiple series of, of different demographic comparisons, and I didn't quite catch what the x-axis was on that. Could you go back to that sure. that slide? Uh, I think you know what you're talking about. It was poverty segregation. This yes, one? this one, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is density of oh. industrial facilities in a census tract. And then this is poverty segregation um, for the county, right? So, so those census tracts that are in places that have really high levels of segregation um, are more likely to have industrial facilities, like a higher density of industrial facilities. Okay, so the x-axis increasing to the right is more segregation? Yes. And yes. how is that measured? Um, that's by decile. Okay. Thanks. I know it's a hard one to explain. Yes, Art. Yeah, um, so you seem to be pessimistic about federal policies and also about like some of the investments are going on by the Biden administration. Sure. I'd like to ask specifically about the Justice 40 initiative, which is mm -hmm. trying to funnel investments towards disadvantaged communities. You know, 40% of the investment yeah. benefits are supposed to go to disadvantaged communities. So, but okay, so I'm actually in a class I'm teaching right now, we are um, interrogating <laughs> the, state site, uh, uh, um, the climate. Columbus Climate Action Plan, the adaptation, adaptation plan that just came out. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, it's great. I'm so happy that we have Justice 40, for sure, it's doing something. Um, but what we propose as adaptation is not necessarily very helpful for the communities. For example, um, we're talking about, you know, increasing uh, energy efficiency, like not, you know, it's not not helpful, right? Certainly useful, but we're talking about issues of, of, of poverty, issues of, uh, people trying to take care of their kids, people trying to deal with long-term health issues. It's just, um, and most of what I've seen of being proposed, at least, you know, from what my understanding is being proposed and trying to be uh, funded by the EPA, are these like, let's get them done type of projects, um, which, you know, dealing with poverty and inequality are not always um, very easily solved with transportation issues of like, I don't know, what were the things I saw? Um, carpools, for example. One of them was increasing the adaptation plan. Have you seen the one that was put out there recently? Um, March 1st, it was submitted to the EPA for the phase one thing. Uh, but it was increasing carpools, which might be helpful, um, which probably will be helpful. But I uh, I just, yeah, it's, I don't know. I'm one of those ones that wants to go more, further. <laughs> Keep pushing, you know. About the work that they're doing. Um, what kind of policies are 
So they, the policy regimes that they looked at were dealing with tobacco, the environment, labor. Um, and again, it, it was a process. So they, somebody had already went into the different policies um, and figured out, okay, these are the ones that are supposed to address you know, tobacco use. And these are the ones that are supposed to address environmental protection. Um, so they they took from a different paper those organizational principles and then applied them. Yeah. Good. Yeah, but I have a little. I'm, you're you have this very nice one kilometer map of chemical uh, releases over the years, right? So I'm I'm kind of curious. How do you how did you construct it? That's that's a very that's a very, very I'm quite quite curious about what your methodology so is. That's a uh, receive uh, risk training environmental indicator data. It's EPA data. Um, so the e the TRI toxic release inventory. Have you heard of that? Basically, industrial. Oh, I think I have it in here. These guys. These industrial facilities are required to submit how much industrial toxins that they put out into the environment to the EPA. That's one of the limitations, right? Because it's people saying, yes, we put out this much and then submitting that more. Okay, well, believing them, um, what the EPA has done uh, is basically used um, is it air dispersion modeling, right? So figured out where if, if a facility is here, and this is the normal wind patterns, and this is how tall the facility is, and this is, you know, whatever, the chemical makeup of the, the uh, molecule, like where would it have landed in this uh, in this area, right? And so once you have those, then you can break this down into one by one water squares. Like, okay, so this, you know, this little, like, here's us, right? Mm -hmm. We have, and then that is a power plant, right? Put out this much pollution, if this, much probably landed here over the year. So then you like aggregate that. Got it, thank you. Yeah, it's it's accessible to everybody. So, and they've actually really made it way more accessible than when I used it. I used to have to send like a big um, hard drive to the EPA and put it in the end. But I don't know if it's special software to deal with it. <laughs> uh, so you'd say just a sporty and adaptability plan and to be more sort of a slow than actually kind of follow it. Like, I've been more hopeful, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a yes. Ah, I don't know about that being pessimistic. Harvey's a positive one. <laughs> uh, I've worked for the DOE for a few years, but uh, uh, it's interesting to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I just think that they're, they want to get things done fast. And so all of the easy kind of, you know, top easy stuff is being done fast rather than, and it's hard, hard to undo, you know, segregation. In that case, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, long divestments of communities, right? And, you know, ineffective policies that haven't worked. So when you put funds into them, what's going to happen? I mean, you don't have the people there to implement them. You know, it's just going to take more, I think, thinking and, and kind of planning than what's being done right now. I have a question about thinking about the social determinants of public policy in relationship to the broader kind of stuff that you're talking about here around like toxic releases and citing of chemicals. Because social determinants of health is obviously a much bigger category, which may or may not be particularly spatial, except that you're spatializing it in, I mean, most of them probably will be on yeah. PR for I think everything spatial. Right. But um, <laughs> but I mean they they'll be spatial in that you're looking at local policies. So they're yeah. spatialized in that sense. Yes. But you know, some of the social determinants themselves are going to be very spatial. Some of them are not. Some of them are going to be about toxic. Some of them are not going to be about toxic. So I'm yeah. curious kind of how yeah. how that's fitting into you know the kind of story that you're telling. Sure. I don't think that the toxics is the limiting factor. It was just my entry into understanding. Uh -huh. Okay. So I don't honestly, I think it's important, um, but social determinants of health, if they don't deal with toxic, someone's uh -huh. fine. Right, right, right. I don't think it's, <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm just thinking about how that works in the in kind of in the, in the story, even of like, you're talking about racial segregation and kind of the ways in which segregation works out. So are the social determinants that you're looking at then 
uh, are they tied to segregation? So is well, that I one of so the... I think that the local policies, right, and the funding that's not going to right. or and historically has not gone to these previously redlined areas uh -huh. is one of the main contributors, right, right. to the. So is that one of your questions? Like you're going to identify a social determinant of health policy and then you're going to look at whether they're in more or less segregated communities or is that kind of the assumption that social determinants of health are? I, I mean, I, I think it is an assumption, I guess. Okay. I, think probably I should investigate it at some point, okay. but I'm more interested in understanding like which ones are working, right? Right. Where are those areas right. that are um, minimizing, right, or that are mitigating this inequality, right? And then what are the policies? So I'd like to plot over time to figure out which of these policy boundaries are doing better than we expect, and then figure out what policies are happening in there. Yeah, it just seems like the policy, like to understand whether a policy is working and how, is itself a complicated question for sure. And two places yeah, might right. have. The same policy, and yeah. one is working and one isn't because of differences on the ground, which might have to do with segregation, for example. I mean, it just seems like that's like a really difficult question. To yeah, I mean, there's like well, there's lots of examples of of people trying to figure out if policies work. Right. Um, of course, and I I'm just going to try to apply it in a in, to a local level. Right. Can I follow, can I follow up on that? Because I mean, a policy regime is so tricky. I mean, there's a ton of literature on policy regimes and in, in, yeah. in police research and uh, trying to understand how particular policies would affect the police impact immigrant communities or non-white communities. Mm -hmm. And the findings are really kind of sketchy because what's legislated in policy very rarely maps on yeah. practice. So you can have policies with respect to dashboard cameras on cop cars or chest cameras uh, but that doesn't mean that police turn the cameras on. Mm -hmm. And in fact, yeah. like ethnographic research shows that there's often a vast discrepancy between what is a policy and like what is actually like going right. on the ground. So, so I actually think that's why it's really important to do spatial analysis because it kind of captures that implementation gap there that you're talking about. So theoretically, the policy is supposed to do that. But when we look at the actual outcomes of this, you know, this policy boundary, this spatial boundary, then what's actually happening? And then you can interrogate it more. Hey, um, I'm curious how you chose, uh, it sounds like your work is focused primarily on airborne particulates. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, because of all the ways in which environmental justice or injustices can be manifest, why did you choose air rather than water, soil? Uh, particularly because the dispersal, the dispersal effects makes sort of a, an air plume, turning yeah. an air plume into a point, yeah, kind of awkward. Yeah, I mean, uh, lead pipes are maybe a little easier to model. Uh, contaminated soil or oh, yeah. Superfund sites are point sources. So they might be easier to. So I, you, it seems like you chose something that's particularly hard to um yeah. <laughs> to place For given sure. given this the spatial focus of your work uh yeah i mean i i wish i wouldn't have <laughs> yeah. but honestly it really did start from that ex those experiences i had in san francisco which is like i just emotionally felt it's you know it, it that, that people breathing in air that's toxic is just disturbing to me <laughs> so that set me off on the air toxics and that was most of my graduate work, right? Um, so okay. that yeah, all of the air stuff is most of my graduate work. Um, and now I'm like, okay, we need to move into trying to, I, I'm really sick of describing inequality, I'm really sick of it. Um, I wanna try to figure out how, where is it, who's able to undo it? Who's able to undo all this, this segregation? Like, So yeah, that's, Thanks. so it's, yeah, it's not a, a very, Intellectual, it's much more emotional response. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the social determinants of health. I'm um, really interested in what you'll find in the future. Um, I just want to um, share that, you know, last year I came here from Florida, um, where uh, because of Governor DeSantis's rampage against DEI, I was hearing um, through the grapevine that uh, the Department of Health employees there were preemptively removing terms like 
social influence of health mm -hmm. and social equity in their documents. And I'm less familiar with the political landscape here, but I guess I wonder if um, you've considered or could consider the absence mm -hmm. of that sort of rhetoric around social mm -hmm. determinants of health. Yeah, I mean, uh, social determinants of health, like I said, is a very big umbrella term. So that's, we're really, like I said, it's very abstract. Um, and I guess has some political connotation, but it actually, I, I should have been surprised about, but, um, but that's why we we're going to the health literature and trying to look at actual measures and saying like, um, this is, so, uh, I'm trying to think what was one of them, um, access. So one of the things, one of the things that we found in, in doing those reviews was like use of food, um, uh, food pantries. So that's a, that's an actual measure, right? Um, so trying to, what, what <laughs> you know, no, I'm coughing. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> But so that that is what we would be um, investigating. So food pantries and you know access to food pantries. So that would be the social determinant of health that we look into the policies. Like what policies are influencing that? So if we know that the literature shows um, access to food pantries, you know, improves health um, uh, cancer outcomes, right? And so then we can go back and say, okay, these are the places that are doing that. How are they doing it? Like, what are the policies that are that are supporting that? Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking about the air pollution thing again because I think mm -hmm. the TRI is not just air. The TRI is air, water, soil. That's true. It's just a limited number of chemicals that they've decided. So yeah, for sure. Not, definitely not all chemicals, but no. that, so that sure. one. So you're you're one you're one kilometer by one kilometer is not just air. Air, water, so oh, yeah. air, no, water, can, soil. Oh, you left, but yeah, yeah that, that's water as well, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I only use the air, though. Okay. Depends right back. Other questions? We all want to like find out, like, we're all like drawn into little pieces of your story. We're like, tell yeah. us about that piece. Tell us about that piece. That's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Something for everybody, then. Are there examples of uh, so you're, you're searching for the policies that reduce the quality in your focus in the US? But if we expand your focus, do we have stories of other places in the world where inequality was reduced? So, do we have a sort of a some idea of the policies that work and that don't before you, as, as you jump into the new one? Yeah, mm. uh, that's what started me on this. I actually, um, I was an alternate, so I this project. I uh, submitted this idea of policies, looking at different policies for social determinants. So um, I submitted to the EU uh, Fulbright. And so I was planning on doing it across e um, the EU. And so there's been some research on that, <laughs> but I haven't spent the time other than putting that grant application together um, to, do, to do it. But um, yeah, I like that. I totally, totally think that's a good way to look at it as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question. I just have a really small clarifying question about whether when you mean conservative and liberal continuum, do you mean partisan or are you just describing the kinds of policies? That is a good question. And when I was reading it, I was like, I should have gone back to their paper and figured out exactly how they defined it. I think I'm I think I, I'm not gonna try to guess. I'm not gonna let's look it up. We'll look it up and then I'll and <laughs> when you're done, we'll come up here and look it up again. Okay. Um I thought it had to do with funding. No, like, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try. Like, because you also have like red and blue on your mind. That's why I'm getting confused. This is an election year. Um, <laughs> 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 Any other questions? If we done early, we can have more time for networking. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's 